Welcome back to my channel. I'm here to talk to you about scene, nope, act two, scene one. It's Summer Night's Dream. Yeah, buddy. So we are in the woods with the fairies. And I don't think we even started talking about it yet, but here we are. This is going to be the best. No, it's not. This is not the best scene, but it will be fun. Um, we start off with Puck coming in to talk to Titania, who is the queen of the fairies. Puck talks about the conflict, the fight between Oberon and Titania over the fact that Titania has kidnapped a human child, taken him to the fairy world, and Oberon is mad. So Oberon, um, or Puck talks to Titania about this issue, and, you know, chaos ensues, as it typically does in the fairy world, and in the play in general. So we're starting off with how now, spirit, whither, whither, wander, you. Just kidding, wander doesn't have an H. But it is nice alliteration of the whither, wander. Um, so that is in line one. It is Puck. And then the fairy who we meet describes the way that fairies move around in nature. That's basically the next line from line two all the way to line 15. So over hill, over dale, etc., etc., until hang a pearl in every cowslip's ear. I'm not going to read. Pardon me, I was just uh, enjoying my Diet Coke. So anyways, um, the fairy describes the connection that fairies have through nature, and it's just quite love, like nicely written. There's some imagery and some alliteration in there. That's all I have to say about it. Puck talks about how upset Oberon is with the fact that Titania has kidnapped the changeling, the human child. Oberon is passing fell and wrath. He is mad. And he will not be sleeping with Titania. Sleeping. Sleeping. Uh, for this, this amount of time that he's mad. Because he's jealous and he wants the human boy for himself. So he is explaining that. Um, so that's basically this page. That's page 27. We're going to move on. Page 29 here. The fairy is starting to figure out who he's, or he or she, I, doesn't, I don't know the gender of the fairy. I'm not going to assume the gender of the fairy either because it's 2020 and we can't do that. So the fairy is going to talk to Puck about Puck a little bit and says, aren't you Puck or Robin Goodfellow, who is the shrewd and knavish sprite. So we get some characterization of Puck and kind of figure out a little bit about who Puck is here and how he's mischievous and kind of some of the things he does to humans um, to mess with them a little bit. Um, he is evil, mischievous. He frightens some of the women in the village and he misleads the travelers and that kind of thing. And he's sort of criticizing him. And then Puck agrees, and he says, yes, I am this fairy. That is what I do, or this sprite. But his goal, or his role in the fairy world, is to make Oberon laugh. He's like the jester of the court of the fairy world, and he is in service to Oberon as kind of the person, not the person, the fairy that makes Puck la or Oberon laugh. So that is how he explains himself. And then he goes into a little bit of detail about the antics that he has, um, what he does that makes Oberon laugh. We've got page 31. We have Oberon and Titania now, and they are mad at one another. Um, Oberon says that he won't be staying with Titania at all anymore, and she's not spending any time with him. And then he insults her a little bit, and she says that every time he goes to the human world, he spends time with other human women. So why would she want to spend time with a husband who just does that? And how could he even love her when he spends time with all these other humans? And he basically says, you're such a hypocrite, you do the same thing, and I know you're in love with Theseus. So they're just basically calling each other out for um, doing the same thing and kind of just having a lover's quarrel, if you will. This is all page 31. They're accusing each other, and that's it. Okay. Okay, page 33. Here we go. Titania says, these are the forgeries of jealousy in the very first line of the page. And this is referring to the way that jealousy can make people believe things that aren't true. It can make you act in um, a way that isn't naturally like you. And it can make you make up lies about things like that that aren't true. And it's something that bad things can happen as a result of jealousy and like the 
I would say, domino effect that can happen from this type of thing. And in this case, the domino effect of the jealousy and the ensuing argument of Titania and Oberon is the way that nature is um, affected by their fight. So Titania gets into great detail. You can see all that detail. Um about what happens in nature after their fight. So she talks a lot about it. It's a lot of nature imagery here. And you can also see the strong ties between the fairy world and nature in this scene about how nature is affected by their fight. So for example, the winds piping to us in vain as in revenge have sucked up from the sea, contagious fogs, which falling in the land hath every pelting river made us so proud. So it's foggy, it's raining really hard on the ocean. And they have overborne their continents, so it's everywhere. The weather has been very bad. Um, the plowman has lost his sweat, and the green corn hath rotted ere his youth attained a beard. So the crops are not doing well. The farmers don't really need to be working very hard. There's nothing for them to do. And it says that there's even too much rain for planting the crops. The, the fields are drowned. So it's just a really terrible time for everybody because of their fight. She later says, the human mortals want their winter cheer. No night is now with him or Carol blessed. So no one is happy. It's like a huge chain effect just from the fight between Titania and Oberon. So basically everything is affected by what happens between these two. And then later on, she says, the rheumatic diseases abound. So even people are getting very ill. And the childing autumn, angry winter. So here's personification of winter being angry, and it sort of makes it seem in that sentence as if nature can be controlled, so as if really Titania and Oberon are in control of what happens with nature. If winter can be angry, then that means that it can be make the decision to have an emotion, which it can't, because we know that. Um, but it's interesting. And... In this case, it's saying Titania and Oberon are in control of nature, but we know that they're not, and that obviously this doesn't result from their fight. Anyways, so that's basically Titania's speech here. Um, we are their parents and their original. So she's just interesting speech there. Moving on to page 35. So Oberon says, do you want to make up then? If all of this stuff is happening and you knows it's our fault... Do you amend it then? It lies in you. You you have the option. You can fix this, Titania. Like, it's all you here. I did nothing wrong, basically. Why should Titania cross her Oberon? I do but beg a little changeling boy to be my henchman. Like, all he wants is for this, like, to have this little human boy. That's all he's asking. But when he's saying this, it's basically putting all of the onus on Titania. Like, it's all her fault. He did nothing wrong. And this kind of points again to the gender roles, like the theme of gender roles in the play and the fact that um, men have all of the power. Um, she is at fault completely, and Oberon is taking no responsibility for what's happening. And that's page 35 at the top. And then Titania says that um, she did not kidnap the child. She found the human mother who was in a bad way. She, the mom died. She took the child as a way of taking care of him. So Oberon should not be mad. Here it says... She being mortal, of that did boy of that boy did die, and for her sake I rear up the boy. For her sake I will not part with him. So she's trying to convince Oberon that it's for the child's best interest that she keep him. So and she will stay there with the child until the wedding day of Theseus. They continue fighting. Okay, so that's page 35. And then um Oberon has a long speech. He decides that he is going to use the love potion on the next living creature that he sees. He calls upon Cupid to use the love potion. Okay, so that's page 37. I'm just going to pause this. Pause. Okay, can I pause it? I can't pause it. So I'm just going to say that this is Part one is when we're going to end with Oberon devising his plan to get the love the love herb and shoot someone. Okay, so continuing when Oberon tells Puck that he wants him to go get um, 
the arrow touched by or the flower touched by Cupid's arrow so he can make the love potion that makes you um, fall in love with whatever you first see when you wake up because he wants to get revenge on Titania because he is mad at her and Puck says he'll be back in 40 minutes he's just gonna zip around the earth and go get it for Oberon. Once um, Oberon has the love juice he's going to drop it into Titania's eye while she's sleeping and in the hopes that she will fall in love with the first animal, beast, whatever, he doesn't care, that she sees when she wakes up. So he says, lion, bear, wolf, bull, or meddling monkey, nice little alliteration there, or a busy ape, she shall pursue it with the soul of love. And ere I take this charm from off her sight, which he can with another herb, uh, it, I'll make her render up her page to me. But who comes here? I'm invisible and I'll overhear their conference. So someone's coming in the forest, and the people who are coming are Demetrius and Helena, and they're arguing because Demetrius is looking for Hermia, but Helena has followed him. And Demetrius now is saying adamantly that he does not love Helena, and he's looking for Lysander and Hermia, who came into the forest of forest to elope, right? And Helena is saying, like, please, I love you. Like, just, uh, like, let me love you. Demetrius is saying, like, come on, how many times can I tell you I don't love you like that? Just leave me alone. And then Helena is so pathetic and saying, the more you beat me, the more I will fawn on you, spurn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me, unworthy as I am to follow you. That, that, why, what worse or place can I beg in your love, and yet a place of high respect with me, than to be used as you use your dog? So she is comparing herself here to a dog, which is kind of how she is, right? She's following after him like a puppy. So what kind of characterization does this give us about her? That she is pathetic, that she doesn't have any respect for herself. But it again can also point to those gender roles of the times, which is that women really had no power, and they were nothing more than a beast, right? They didn't get a say, they didn't have a choice in, in any matters. So it's kind of interesting that she's saying that. And Demetrius then says, I am sick when I look on thee. And then Helena says, I'm sick when I don't look on you. So it's just, it's so pathetic and sad. And like, I just have, I, her character at this point, we just don't like her. Um, and Demetrius says, you impeach your modesty too much to leave the city and commit yourself into the hands of one that loves you not, to trust the opportunity of night. So it, it, he's basically saying, like, you're really dumb. You're, you're not modest. You're giving yourself in the hands of someone that doesn't love you, and you're kind of putting yourself in a vulnerable position here by coming into the forest with a strange man at night. It's very sketchy. Um, and the ill counsel of a desert place with the rich worth of your virginity. So he's just kind of saying, like, if you're a lady, you really shouldn't be doing this. He Would he do something to her? Probably not. But he's saying, like, you shouldn't be doing this. It's very sketchy, and it doesn't make you look any better than you already do by chasing after me. And again, she just kind of keeps going on. And then she says, there's no one here, though. Like, no one can see that I'm doing this, so it doesn't matter. Dimitri says, I'll run from you and hide me in the breaks and leave thee to the mercy of wild beasts. So Dimitri is literally saying, like, I will leave you here to die. And Helena is saying, I don't care. I love you anyways. I will always love you. Demetrius, I will not stay thy questions. Let me go. So he's like, leave me be. I'm just trying to find the woman I care about. Who doesn't care about him either? So I don't know what he's doing, just chasing after Hermia. And then Helena says, In the temple, in the town, in the field, you do me mischief. Your wrongs do set a scandal. Oh, boy. Hello. Hold on.